Hey guys, Dustin Wynn. Hey, this is Scott Snyder. This is Paul Dini. And you're listening to Bat Force Radio. And you're listening to Bat Force Radio. You're listening to Bat Force Radio. This is Kevin Conroy, the voice of Batman. And you're listening to Bat Force Radio, so stay tuned. back to bat force radio thank you for joining us again uh we've got a, a pretty perfect topic for uh you know we're getting into late october getting into this halloween season and we're getting into some of the uh more spooky horror kind of subject matter so we've got bat force tom in california hey we've got gramps in texas howdy i feel like i maybe it's just in my mind i feel like i go a little texas with my voice when i say gramps mm -hmm. gramps and you know, gramps and i'm robin cross in canada and this week's guest is an author illustrator and eisner winning comic creator known for work like the mire batgirls punisher designing one of the top 10 batman black and white statues ever made as well as being the first female illustrator to draw the mainline batman comic still you that it took so long for that to happen but her next big thing is a new creator-owned book called somna that she is co-writing and co-illustrating with tula lote for the new publisher distillery that is beginning up uh, december no holy november 22nd and welcome to the show becky clunan Now, uh, just to clarify, amongst the three different dates that I gave there, it is November 22nd That's that uh, November 22nd. Somna number one is coming out. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just, you know, seeing if people are paying attention, keep you on your toes. But thank you for being here. How are you? I'm good. I'm very good. I'm just drawing away, you know. <laughs> mm. Oh, you're uh, double duty. You're drawing yeah. and talking. Wow. Drawing and talking. Well, I'm not drawing right now. But oh. I'll try to pay attention, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, we, we, we'll try to pay attention, too, so it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, deadlines. We've had some artists before. I think uh, Clay, Clay Mann was one. I want to say Ben Templesmith was another, where they were literally, like, working while we were talking to them. Oh, yeah. And somehow, I don't know how you guys do it. Like, you're able to have a conversation or listen to a podcast and draw. That's kind of insane. <laughs> I, th I think some of it is just, um, well, it depends on what stage of the drawing process, like, is when I can listen to stuff, you know, mm -hmm. like when you're when I'm like having trouble with something, or if I'm like doing roughs or trying to figure something out or like thumbnailing, like either nothing, like silence or like ambient soundtrack stuff, just, you know, because otherwise, like, I can't concentrate on it, you know, but I can have like a podcast or audiobook going if I'm like drawing or inking. When it, when it gets to like the the easier stuff we had charles soul on once and you know i'm sure you're aware he's also a practicing lawyer and he was he apologized for the sound of ruffling papers as we were talking to him because he was working a case while he was talking to us about comic books i don't know how someone even that's, has the mental capacity yeah. for that yeah that's impressive to me <laughs> yeah i'm lucky if i don't he's spill my drink while we talk <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was waiting for you to jinx yourself there. Ah. Anyway, well, uh, let's get on to uh, to you. So I know you have given this story over and over again, but we do like to start with your own origin story. Yes. Uh, so not yeah. just comics, but overall. So if uh, if you can remember, what was the very first thing that made you think you wanted to write or illustrate or do comics whatever it was um well i've always liked comics since i can remember um my dad read comics like on and off not too much i think he was like a big big like silver surfer fan back in the day and so he would pick up and like read me silver surfer stories for like bedtime 
Mm-hmm. So I, like at like eight years old, I knew like the politics of like the Kroll's free war, like the, the Kroll, the Skrull free war and like all that, like Shalabal, like that whole story was just super intriguing to me. Um, and I think I figured out that I wanted to draw comics once I realized that I was just kind of bad at school, you know, and everything that I was interested in, like you need to, like, I was like, I want to be an archeologist because, you know, it'd be fun to like dig up bones, but then it's like, oh, but you need probably to do a lot of school for that. And <laughs> it's like, what can I do that doesn't require much school? And it's drawing comics, which is the, you know, seemed like a good, um, I don't know. It's one of those things where you just kind of make a decision in your head at a very young age and for better or for worse, you just kind of stick with it. And so in that respect, I feel like I'm kind of lucky because I've never had, like, I've always known this was the thing that I was going to do really? um, from wow. a very young age. And um, even when I kind of like diverted from it, I always like found my way back to it. Um, like in college, I went to school for animation and ended up dropping out and drawing comics anyway. So it's like, even though it's like, you know, you, you try to do something else, <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't necessarily work out the way you think it's going to. But you escaped that period in the 90s where everyone thought they wanted to be a marine biologist. You know, that's what's on the list also. <laughs> that's on the list. Yeah. Yeah, I drew, um, I drew a comic when I was in, like, middle school about, like, sharks getting thinned for some reason. It was pretty dark. It was, like, these sharks running around with, like, baseball hats and, like, you know, they were just, like, regular dudes, but they were sharks. And they were just... Like one of them came up and he had like no fins and you're like, oh my God, it was pretty dark actually. for him. So you've always <laughs> been kid. like this. I've always been like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, now you would have, you might have to change the focus of, because sharks aren't even the dangerous thing now. I know. Like now yeah. it's, uh, it's the killer whales. Yeah. Like they're the, mobilizing. How smart they are. And, yeah. And, and they're like, social. That makes and, them dangerous. Yeah. And I read the, this article that, uh, I don't know how they're smart enough to do this, but they're finding these great white shark bodies that the killer whales have been as the article put it with near surgical precision they've been cutting open the great white shark eating its liver and leaving the rest of the body to rot that's that's something that i feel like uh, killer whales have done like with um like seals and stuff like they'll just toy with a seal and when yeah. they're finished with it, they'll only eat like a tiny, like the liver, like a tiny succulent bit, yeah. which is like, you know, maybe mm. even the most, t- I don't know, it sounds awful to me. Yeah. We're and lucky they, t- they can get on land. <laughs> <laughs> they teach, they, don't they teach their babies how to, how to, uh, how to kill by playing with like, uh, you know, whatever cute penguins or sea lions that they can find. They They toss them around and they let their kids like learn through play how to how to hunt and kill so smart wow this is really going off track but wow (laughs) yeah (laughs) that's that's part for the course around here (laughs) yep so that that was what got you uh the itch to create what was the first step that you took towards uh finding that way um I, i think it was just not you know I think everyone has a different path into comics. I don't think there's like one right way to do it. And it's such a weird industry that like, there is no right way to break in at all. Or like, so I, um, when I left school, it was mostly because like, I thought being in animation would give me like a more, like a more stable job than comics. Cause it was like the late nineties and like, you know, the comic industry was a little sad. And it, looking at it from the outside, I was like, I just don't think I can make this work. So I wanted a job like animation, which seemed to be thriving. Um, and then all of a sudden, like all the animation studios closed like all at once in like the early 2000s. So I was like, well, this isn't like the plan changed. Um, and when I left school, I was just um, like I was going to comic conventions anyway. Um, but I just started making my own mini comics and like bringing them to shows and giving them to people. And that's how I met like. A bunch of a bunch of creators that way like i I think david mack was like one of the first Hmm. uh professionals that i met and you know i was a kabuki fan from like back in when it was like come i mean it's coming out issues i guess uh and i introduced myself and he was so supportive he was like every time he saw me after that at a con he would like ask me if i had a new mini comic and so that became a thing where Uh it's like oh this is like someone had read my book and liked it and even if it was just 20 pages of one page comics 
it like made me want to do more. So I very, I started very small. I was doing like four page stories and like five page stories and just like bundling to get them together in like mm. little 20 page books that I would copy at Kinko's. And um, yeah, from there, it was just like a slow grind. <laughs> it's always been a slow grind, I guess. But yeah, I just, you know, you just meet people and it was very organic. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's you... a funny thing about the industry. I don't know if it should change or if part of the interesting collective of people that become comic creators, part of it is that they had to find their own way. But it's weird how it's unique amongst similar industries in that there isn't a, a channel to go through to get to it. You know, yeah. if you want to be a movie director, there's a path to doing that where you go through school and then you get uh, intern positions or things like that. And then you end up you know, working under directors, but in the field that you're after, and then you graduate up there, there isn't anything for comics. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing really for comics. There's like a few schools out there. Um, and I, you know, I'm of two minds with like education or education, you know, on one hand, I, really enjoyed my time at SVA, even though it put me majorly in debt. Um, I met a lot of people who became my peers after that. Um, I had a lot of great teachers and it definitely, I definitely was like very focused and um, the animation department had like a very rigorous, like life drawing classes. I was there all drawing all the time. And so it definitely made me focus and like um, helped me learn. But at the same time, it was like, um, Ed Ralph Bakshi as a teacher, which was incredible. Oh, wow. Um, and when Crazy. everything went 3D, I remember talking to him about it and being like, what am I going to do? Like, I, I can't, like, I don't want to take 3D animation. I don't want to spend an extra year at school learning, like taking, becoming an illustration major, which was like a lot of people were leaving 2D animation for illustration or for 3D. Um, and I was like, I just don't, I don't want to do that. Like, and he's like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, you know, I'd like to, I've, I've always wanted to just make comic books. And he's like, well, there's nothing you stop stopping you from that. And I was like, but I don't want to take the extra year. I can't afford it. You know, basically like going an extra year to school to get that degree. And he's like, no one's ever going to ask you for your degree like, <laughs> to make a comic. Like you think people are <laughs> you're going to need like a bachelor's in fine arts to like work for DC. I'm like, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm 20 years old. <laughs> yeah. I know nothing. <laughs> So that was like some great advice. And so after that, I did drop out. Um, but I learned so much from the people there and from like, you know, I was part of Meat House, which was like a collective with um, like James Jean was in it. Nate Powell was in it. Um, uh, Toma Hanukkah was in it. It was just like, I could just rattle off a list of people who were in this group. And it was all, it was all just students making comics together. But it was like, I learned so much from those guys, uh, just being in like the room with them. Um, so that, you know, in that respect, all that debt was really worth it. <laughs> so what was it like when you first held or saw your artwork or a story you made on like, you know, a published comic by like, you know, DC or Marvel or somebody like that? What was that feeling like? It was kind of surreal. Um, and it's almost like that thing where you don't want to believe it because it's like then it's real you know and uh, so many things can go wrong once it's a real thing <laughs> <laughs> but it's all it's always kind of cool to go in and be like oh yeah like i did that thing that's over there like that's kind of that's kind of fun there's like a i get a mix of like pride and embarrassment like i'm like nobody look at it no look at me <laughs> no no you I start picking it apart yeah yeah like you know i don't want to be near it <laughs> but at the same time it, it does bring me joy it's like yeah. very like i have a lot of conflicting feelings about it you know it's hard to it's go. like you like it, but you also kind of like are fearful a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, my mom and my stepdad came to visit me recently, and of course we were in a bookstore, and my stepdad's like, "Are any are any your books in here?" And I'm like, "Please be quiet." <laughs> like, leave me alone. <laughs> really? I leave the store. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's just it's it's too much sometimes. Mom. <laughs> oh, they're proud. Yeah, it's that's nice. funny. And now you yeah. have your own Batman Black and White. I mean, that's like. That's great. That was crazy. Yes. I felt like, and, I and it's a top ten one, there. dude. I mean, oh, that yeah, is so good. that's the best cape out of all of them. And well, thank you. Just the fact that he's like floating midair. I mean, it kind of yeah. gives him that aura of additional 
badass spookiness. I love it. And, uh, Thank you. It's like almost like a spiral of the cape. And then they used a piece, a, a specific piece of yours, and they, they, I couldn't believe how well they nailed a, the cape like that. Oh, yeah. That was crazy. Um, I kept thinking it was going to break. I was like, people are just going to send me broken pieces of cowl in the mail. <laughs> but it worked out. I mean, it looks Yeah, really it's cool. designed really well. Uh, I think okay. it was Irene Matar that Irene sculpted Matar it. Irene did, yeah. did the sculpture, and she just, like, she killed. She's so good, though. Everything she sculpts is, like, I want to work on her. I work with her again. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we talked about, uh, so you, you getting to see those the, the first time that your work was published by, you know, quote, the, the big companies. But your your career has had this interesting mix of that, not only that success, but having the a kind of success that n very few people will see in that you won an award, you know, the, the big awards, you know, like the Eisners are kind of the Oscars of, of comics. And you won an award, not only just winning an Eisner, but for a self-published book that uh you did everything yourself that's oh, yeah. uh that's a really impressive achievement thank you um that was like that was a weird time because i had i was trying to write more and you know i had to, i've only worked with writers for most of my career um and everyone who i talked to was like well what have you written and i was like i don't know <laughs> like, <laughs> maybe a few things here and there but nothing um that really proved that i could do like tell a story so I kind of went back to what I did starting out, which was making mini comics. And also to kind of like rediscover, because I've been doing so much licensed stuff before that. Um, and like working on something that's my own is different. So I wanted to like kind of rediscover like that excitement of writing and drawing a story for myself. Um, and so the year before that, I did one called Wolves, and then The Mire, of course, and then the follow up one was called The Meter. And a lot of it with Wolves in the Mire, I mailed out so many copies to people. Like, I just reached out to anyone that I could think of. And I was like, what's your address? I'm going to send you a comic. <laughs> <laughs> and then I put the PDF up online for, I think it, I had it up for free for a bit. And then I think it was for like 99 cents. So it was, e it was like easy for people to read. So you could buy a physical copy for me from my store online, or you could read it digitally for pretty cheap. And I think part of, winning an award was like strategically getting your comic in front of as many people as possible and to do that with like a creator owned book and like a self-published book is a little tricky but there's like now there's ways to make things like you know you could just sell pdfs online pretty easily uh and so it's easier now more than ever to get your stories in front of people um but it, i was at a good spot in my career where it's like I had a platform already made yeah. for that. So there was like definite like, you know, I had some advantages. <laughs> I think if I had tried to do that starting out, it would have been difficult. But you know, the Meyer was kind of fun. It was also a story that like it's so short. You know, there were there were like twenty four pages or something like that. And I was like, how do I make this comic seem longer than it actually is? So then it's like you put a little twist at the end <laughs> that makes you have to reread the whole thing. Because oh, you're like, yeah. oh the narrator isn't who I thought the narrator was. And learning that makes you want to go and reread it. So if you read it twice, you've ostensibly read a, a you know, 40 page comic and I only did 24 pages. So it's like <laughs> kind of a trick. <laughs> this has some, some clever, uh, some clever work clever. in the system. It was clever. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it it's been entirely to our benefit that your success in the creator and stuff uh, didn't entirely keep you from doing stuff at, you know, the, the, the Marvel and DC kind of stuff. Your work in general, particularly your, your illustration, you bring a, a flavor to like the, the big characters, you know, of, of Marvel and DC that we get looks and atmospheres that you don't get from these characters off you you have more like this uh sort of horror-esque aesthetic in general to your stuff like one of my favorite covers this one here your punisher cover oh yeah and you, you don't see punisher stuff that looks like this you know unfortunately but yeah. that's such a great one so before the before the um show started robin and i were talking and having a conversation about what 
how would you describe her style? And he and I kind of agreed on what we think, but I did want to ask you, how would you describe your artwork and, and your style? Well, I think when I started out, um, you know, of course I like read a ton of manga and that was like a big influence on me when I was a kid. And so some of it was like trying to, at a certain point, it's like you're getting jobs, but they're like, don't make it look so like, don't make it look like manga. Or like, <laughs> so part of it is like trying to hide that influence, you know? Mm. Uh, and then part of it is, uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, a lot of forlorn looks and maybe like, I don't know, it's a little pre raphaelite <laughs> <laughs> kind of angst um and like the subject matter maybe uh but yeah i don't it's hard to i don't know if i can really name what kind of like the style i guess i don't know it's hard yeah. it's I've yeah that's, always that's felt the same like thing I'm we not, struggled with i, I get I'm not, it like, too. indie enough to be an indie comic but it's not mainstream enough to be like a, a mainstream like a house style or like anything like that so you know i, I don't know Robin and I, we were we were referencing, um, you know, Somna, and there was this one panel where Roland, the husband, is looking yeah. at is looking at her, and he's got this look in his eye. And to me, I was like, you know what? I mean, her art kind of invokes some of those early 1900s silent film or uh universal For monster Glenn movie like, posters yeah yeah that's what i what, FW what I, I learned a lot about inking and balancing the black and white from watching old black and white films you know a lot of noir films a lot of silent films because the film quality wasn't quite as good so mm -hmm. the black and whites were a lot starker um and like more high contrast so when you look at a Fritz Lang film, there's absolutely there's absolute balance in like every frame of one of his movies. And you could just go in and like look at one of those and like basically everything I've ever drawn, I've ripped off from Fritz Lang. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that is a huge influence on me. It's a black and white film <laughs> for well, sure. Cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow, I nailed it. That's you good. nailed it. You really did. Well, now, now that we have popped the top on that, uh yeah, the the main thing that we are here to talk about is somna yeah. now we won't go uh horribly spoilery here so somna i assume comes from the word somnambulism which is you know sleepwalking uh yeah now our uh heroine i guess of the story doesn't do exactly sleepwalking uh maybe you could call it sleep wanking but uh <laughs> It, in uh, in, in essence, I, I, <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe we'll bleep that out. But uh, so uh, I know that uh, you and Tula had been working on this story for a long time. Yeah. Uh, where did uh, the the whole concept uh, for the story come from? That uh, that you've been kind of working so, away at it for so long. This story came from it was um a long time ago because i was living in new york at the time uh and i had i used to get and i don't really get it anymore but sleep paralysis and i okay. didn't know what it was for a while and i was like my apartment is fucking haunted like there's a ghost in here <laughs> and it, or like there's a deep there's something going on in my house that sucks and if you've ever had sleep paralysis you know what i'm talking about because it's like you're asleep but then you know you kind of wake up and then you can't move and there's like Sometimes you'll be like, there's someone standing in the corner, but like I can see like their figure, but I can't turn my head to like look at them because I'm stuck. So it's like you're awake, you're definitely lucid, but you're also like still asleep. And I actually looked it up when I got too scared to like, I, you know, you experience this thing a few times and you're just like, what the hell is going on with me? Um, when I looked it up, it's like your brain is still telling your body that it's asleep. It's still like, you know, in sleep mode, but you are also awake at the same time so that's like kind of why you can't move and then because you get you, you get scared you start imagining things or like seeing things that aren't there because your body's like oh shit something's wrong and so it's like you'll see like i don't know some people see different stuff but it's like 
I feel like there's documentaries and stuff about it, but I was like, man, what a great concept if it was like, what if you had sleep paralysis and you like lived in a time when it like wasn't cool to have something like that, <laughs> you know, like at a time when people were more, you know, like this comic is set in England in the 17th century when things were more like, you know, puritanical and like beliefs were like way more intense and it's like, oh yeah, that would be a great like demon possession story. You know, it's like, what if you have this and everyone thinks they're being possessed by a demon? And you would think that too, because that's what like you're hearing everywhere, you know, like that demons are real and that they, you know, are ready to tempt you into horrible things. Um, so that's kind of like where the kernel started at. And then I was like, but what if we made it sexy? <laughs> 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 and scary, because there's nothing scarier than like than like something being sexy but then it's also awful you know like <laughs> why is this sexy it's a horrible thing um so there's something horrific about that um and kind of sexy about that too so it kind of like the idea like fed on itself and i told lisa about it um when we were oh i feel like we did a convention in like sweden or something like we were like walking around and I was just like, I've got this idea and I'd love to work on it with you because I feel like I'm not brave enough to do this comic on my own. <laughs> it's just so far out there. Um, and I just love her art so much and yeah. I love her so much. So it was like a cool, um, she was like, yeah, totally, I would definitely do this with you in a heartbeat. Like I kind of described the story and at the, at the time it was like a kernel of the story. It wasn't even like, you know, definitely not um, where it is. And she said, yes. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go home and write it. So I wrote out this outline for, it was probably like a six issue thing, like a normal comic. Um, and yeah, it, it, then she got busy and I got busy and then years and years and years went by. And every time we'd meet up, she'd be like, when are we going to do that comic together? And I'm like, we'll do it one day. <laughs> But and it you was both just got like, busy uh, were, doing huge yeah. books and winning awards, and yeah, it is hard. Just it's hard being superstars. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's one of those things where everything just like fell into place this year, though. Like my schedule cleared up like pretty miraculously, and like her schedule cleared up, and distillery um, happened, and you know we were asked to be a part of that, and I was like. I was like, Lisa, this is perfect. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. we gotta, now we got to do it now. <laughs> right. So that yeah. it just kind of like the stars aligned. And sometimes a project that you really want to do doesn't come together and it just needs time to work itself out. So what I love about um, this book that we saw and read, and I can't wait for the readers to see this in November is that, you know, you have a, beautiful blend of two different storytellers and artists in the same book and it's cool how it works out and i'm trying to be non-spoiler as possible but at first i was like i didn't realize um i thought that you did all the artwork and then i then i did a little more, more research i was like oh no tula wow okay this makes yeah, perfect wow. sense. Yeah, this <laughs> makes perfect sense. But then I like when your artwork comes in, it like really pops, you know, it really yeah. pops and it it's... really brings in the, the reality that sets in. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, um, you know, when we were talking about how to divvy up the art on the story, um, it became, it was pretty obvious where it's like, Oh yeah, because it's about sleep paralysis and dreams are like a huge part of it. You know, it just made sense for Lisa to do the dream sequences, but then it became like, okay, how do we make, you know, how do we do like divide the story up so that we have an equal amount of pages per issue. Um, and then, you know, how does the story, like, how are we going to progress the story and like what happens and what are my pages going to feel like? And how do we tell the reader, like, this is how the story works. So we, there's all these things about like, how we had to kind of um get the like just get everything in the right place for this whole thing to work um and so that's it was a challenge but it's been a lot of fun to figure out it's like a big puzzle you know mm -hmm. and just um, her work is so ethereal and so surreal and so like dreamy anyway like oh uh, just yeah 
so good. And just for the listener, um, she mentions Lisa. Tula oh, yeah, that's Tula. Lote is the pen name for Lisa Wood. So yeah. they're one in the same. Yeah. I can call her Tula if it's easier. Oh, that's it doesn't matter. matter. <laughs> the, 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 the disclaimer is that people have no excuse to uh, to not understand now. But uh, for for anyone who has already picked this up, uh, the Devil's Cut that came out, what, a month or two ago, did give a little taste of how things work in Somna with, you know, the the shared art duties. So if you haven't picked that up, if you can still find it, go check it out and find what blighted flame burns in thee. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a, a great little. Now, the one thing that I wanted to ask is, is this going to exactly play into Somna at some point or was this just a, a little taste? That was just a little taste. It was kind of a proof of concept because um, Tula and I had never worked together before. So this was our chance to really like, like kind of figure out like how does, how does she work for me? Um, and you know, with, with this one, uh, she came up with the story concept and then I broke it down and then we kind of just went from there. I was like, okay, I'll do like this. This is going to be my segment. And then this is where you pick up and this, this, and then you get to do your segment, which is kind of how we, how we figured it out. <laughs> um, but this was like a very good, it was like a, just an exercise for us to kind of learn how to, how to make it work, you know? And it really did like working on this book, uh, this, this story, uh, really kind of cleared some things up as far as like give us more confidence in like diving into Somna. Um, and I kind of learned a little bit more about how she works and she learned more about how I work. And then so we were able to kind of like develop our language when we when we write and draw together. Very cool. Yeah. So given that uh, it is not going to turn uh, you know into part of Somna, is there any chance that we might at any point see a little bit more of uh blighted i you know i don't think so just because i think that story was just you know when it's in your head as like a little one shot it's hard to yeah. sometimes be like oh what's is there more to this it's like no it's just a sad story she gets locked mm -hmm. in a box and that's it <laughs> damn yeah and see that's that's <laughs> yeah. where i was left i felt like i was locked in the box I'm like okay i gotta see yeah. what happens now if we did any more with that it would be like i mean it would ruin the ending <laughs> <laughs> of this story <laughs> yeah it's know. not a happy story we weren't this story isn't happy either so we're not we're not here to i don't know get people out of the box <laughs> <laughs> now well, you obviously. did mention <laughs> you did mention earlier uh getting the ask to be part of distillery so for anyone who isn't aware distillery is a new publisher with an insane list of founding creators uh like oh my God, yeah. james tynan and christian ward uh scott snyder francesco francovia ram v jock yourself and tula and uh lee garbett and mark bernard it's it's insane that's uh, but anyway oh, oh and will dennis is yeah the man like that's it's such a cool piece of vertigo sort of uh included in distillery with with will being there you know you get yeah kind of a feeling of you know the just that link to vertigo and how how important vertigo was at the time and having this it it feels like a torch being passed uh to distillery with will being there uh how did it come about how were you asked what was the the process like of all this coming together um i don't know like the very beginnings of it because I, I wasn't there for how exactly it formed um but uh chip Mosier and david steinberg were from comicology and they left like years like a year before or something like that um and so i think this had been like a project that they had in mind like we want to do something that's like using what they learned there um but just you know they're they both are they love comics so much so what i love about it is that it's like a comic first publisher that's like not you know they're not here to like ip farm or like to um you know we're not trying to 
sell this to like Hollywood. We're trying to make good comics and try to make like amazing books. Um, and they have a really cool like digital angle too, which like I'm, I don't know anything about <laughs> digital stuff really. You heard me earlier. I was like, and then you can buy a PDF online. I'm, <laughs> I'm ancient. <laughs> um, like I, uh, it's, so what they're doing is pretty cool and innovative. Uh, and of course, when Chip asked me if I want to be part of it, he's like, yeah, we got like, you know, two was on board and like we asked Jock and Scott and it's just like, stop. I'm, yes, I'm in. Like, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just a cool, and then they, you know, of course we're like, um, I think I probably had talked to them about doing this like at some point or because, you know, we, Lisa and I have talked about this book forever. <laughs> so they, I think they knew about it and they're like, we need to continue this book together. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I'm in, I'm on board. Like, and at the time, um, we like all my DC work was kind of ending. Um, you know, we left Wonder Woman at, eight, at issue 800. And so I think that was like just about to wrap up. And then uh, Backgirls was ending. So it's like, this was a perfect opportunity, really. Like everything just kind of segued into, into Somna, which was great for me. It, it worked out somehow. I don't know. Sometimes yeah. in comics, you feel like you're running really fast down a hill and like you can't, your feet are like going and it's like, I don't know how I'm gonna, what's gonna happen next? And oh my God, there's a rock. Like, but somehow it just keeps like things just work out, which is kind of nice. Well, just for me, looking at the lineup of the, the creators, it, I could be totally wrong, but it seems like we're going to see more stories like Somna that uh, kind of have a lot of the spooky horror elements, but also a little bit more mature. Is that true? Or is that kind of, I think so. I think it was like, yeah. you know, they're trying to do probably more mature, but I think people are just, that's what you want to do. I think. Um, and I, and of course, a lot of the people that are working for them now have like amazing horror, like repertoires already. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's like, oh yeah, if if James doesn't do a horror book, I'd be disappointed in him as a friend. <laughs> <laughs> like I want more horror from them. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Who does? Uh, I just finished reading yesterday. He's uh, the first issue of his Dracula. Oh yes, yeah, that looks so good. Oh my god. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just like, it's kind of nice. Um, you know, I do think, some, especially with Somna too, like I was a little worried because it's like a very much, it's a mature erotic comic. So it's like, that's a hard sell for some people. It's a period piece, which is like also a hard sell for some people. So I was <laughs> like, oh my God, we're just like, so it's like their second book that they're doing. And I'm like, we're just throwing all the <laughs> curveballs. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, but like, while, while that is true, uh, as someone who works in a comic shop, I can tell you that the opposite is also true as well. Uh, there are, you know, segments of people that will pick up the book not only because you are on it and because Tool is on it, but specifically because of the different a- aspects of the subject matter. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and not to, I don't want to make people think that this is, you know, the book is not all about sex. You know, but there's an aspect of that to it, but there's, you know, the, the whole witch hunting period, uh, you know, all that stuff going on. And there, there are really, uh, other great aspects to it. And, you know, don't be, uh, don't shy yeah. away from it because you think it's all, it's all eroticism. There's a lot, uh, a lot of other substance to it as well. And we did a lot of research for this. And part of it is like, you know, I think when you're doing a historical fiction or something like that and i hesitate to even use the word historical fiction with when it comes to somna because so much of it like hammer horror is like one of our biggest like me and tula just love old hammer films and like um that was like a big influence on this and we kind of wanted it to feel like that and i you know i wouldn't necessarily call like witchfinder general historical fiction (laughs) (laughs) like it's a historical movie i guess it's like set it's a period piece but it's um but we did a lot of research for this as far as like, you know, the setting and um, clothes and what people, uh, you know, I, I've, I read a bunch of um, like, like sermons from the time too, just to like get in the mindset of like, what are people, what are, what are people, you know, when they go to church, what are they hearing and like, what are their beliefs and, you know, just to kind of get there. So, you know, you got to go down that rabbit hole a little bit, which is like the <laughs> fun part of doing anything like this. 
So it isn't to say that this is just like a, you know, I don't want to write this book off (laughs) being like, oh yeah, it's just a a sexy period romp. It's, it's, no, you know, we did put some work into it. (laughs) I don't want to be too spoilery and we can cut this out, but the main character, Ingrid, is her name kind of a hint for something? Because Ingrid means, um, fair you know as in beautiful but more specifically scandinavian ing's beauty and ing was the god of earth fertility you know so (laughs) (laughs) i hate to put you on the spot that's amazing that's amazing that you did that uh because world's (laughs) greatest detective back Mm when (laughs) back when we were thinking about the comic we were like in Sweden at a comic show at a, a small place called, uh, it was like a city called Uppsala. And we had such a good time at the show. We're like, we should do this comic together. And like, I told her, I told, you know, Tula the idea. And, sh- and she's like, we should set it in Sweden. And of course we're like standing on these crazy burial mounds. And I'm like, yeah, like, let's do it. Like, well, we got super excited. So my first pass at the script when I was going through and like broke kind of the whole story that we had talked about down, um, it, it like we I just looked up a bunch of Swedish names and I just kind of plugged in a bunch. Um, so, some of them stayed, some of them didn't. But it was like when um, I went back to it, I reread like what I had written and then, like years later. And usually it's like, oh, what what the hell did I write? But I was actually like, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a talk about it. We went through the ideas and we had to change the format of it a bit. So things in the story did change from like when we had talked about it way back when. But I was like, do you want to keep these names? Like, they were just kind of placeholders at the time. You know, mm-hmm. when you think about it, it's like, here's, we just need names for these characters. Here we go. And she's like, no, I love these names. And so that's kind of, Ingrid was just, we just picked it, like, out of the air. And, like, I think Tula might have thought of it. She's like, we should name her Ingrid. And it's like, fuck yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's just how it went. Yeah, so it's a, it, just kind of a funny way to, <laughs> to do things. But, yeah. I was like, we could do things that are like more like, I don't know, more localized names, something that would make sense for like the, the place and the time period. And it was like, no, oh, no, these names are fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So no, it, absolutely not. <laughs> Any thought into the names. I went too <laughs> highbrow. Like, okay. I do like that though, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say that from now on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> more than welcome to. It. <laughs> yeah. Stealing it. Uh, that's a good idea. I'm glad you thought of it. <laughs> That's just how I read things, and I'm like, "That's good." I go, I mean, I'm like that too. I'll go that deep into something when it's not mine. <laughs> because I think everything is a clue. You know, every yeah. panel. I think everything is a clue. I mean, I'm I'm so. I don't know. I look at like um, I've got this copy of the cover of Batman '89 that I'm looking at, and I'm like, you know, in the skyscrapers there are certain lights lit up in the buildings back there and i'm like mm, i wonder if that's morris code i mean i you know that's <laughs> how i am so i love it i love it that's like some horror shit <laughs> <laughs> that's so good um there are a bunch of things like foreshadowing uh not to be like too heavy-handed with it so i did like there are like hints in there and like some i don't know some clues as to what is going to happen so hopefully like when the story is concluded it'll be like oh that's what this was yeah but yeah i don't know it's not super subtle (laughs) it's not a subtle (laughs) comic (laughs) no it's not hopefully hopefully it's a little creepy and like hopefully it's a little sexy i mean tula took care of all that so i'm happy about that (laughs) did you whenever you saw some of her panels did you like say oh my god lisa (laughs) i did i clutched my pearls so hard (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's so good. Uh, it's so good. <sighs> yeah. She's she's brave. She's yes. I know. She has no fear. That's why I needed her to do this book with me, like you see. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> now the uh the sol- the solicitation for the series uh says for fans of the witch and midsummer. Uh I would go even farther than that, uh to say it's also, uh, from my point of view, for fans of Neil Gaiman and Sandman as well, uh, there's a, a certain Sandmanness to it here with uh, the 
you know, you've got this uh, sort of, you know, not to spoil too much, but aspects of of a dream world. Well, obviously, it's from the name Somna, you know, and Somnambulism. Obviously, there's something to do with the dream world here and uh, the way that uh, that sort of relates to the waking world. Uh, I just saw that uh, sort of similarity in there. So if that's something else that uh, that you're a fan of, uh, there's another reason to check this out. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a big compliment. And I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what did we have left here? Well, uh, I suppose, Gramps, did you want to hit a lightning round here? Oh, I mean, we can if, if our guest is up for oh, that. God. Yeah, I'll try. And it's basically just random questions I can yeah. think of off the top of my head uh, yeah. just to get to know you better. Um, so, you know, before going into an in interview, I always do a little research and I see that you were born in Italy. Yeah. I had no oh. choice in the matter. It just happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, as an Italian... <laughs> what is your favorite style of pizza oh i just really like a straight up margarita like just very plain i don't like a lot of toppings on it yeah as plain as it can get um and i'm also vegan so vegan cheese <laughs> which kind of stinks but you know we're here we're, that's what we're doing <laughs> okay. all right what kind of music do you like um oh. yeah <laughs> Uh, I listen to a lot of uh, metal. Probably is up there. Um, yeah, I I know uh, I know you're a fellow Immortal fan. But yeah, I love Immortal. Um, I got to meet Abbott lunch, which was great. <laughs> I did a tour yeah, poster I've, for him a few years back. Which yeah, hilarious. I've seen photos of uh, of uh, <laughs> oh, some of your yeah. pictures with him. Uh, I know Tom wanted to be here for for part of this. Tom dropped off the call, so something must have come up. But yeah, I know yeah. he wanted to talk about this stuff. But uh, yeah. yeah, I've done a lot of a lot of gig posters, and yeah, one of them was for uh, good old Abbott. Yeah, I'll I'll get more specific. Favorite Immortal album, and is it at the heart of winter? It is at the heart of winter. Yes. Actually, Same. <laughs> Same. it's it's the only answer. It's it's really a good answer. It's just so good. Do you yeah. play any instruments yourself? I did not, or I do not. Uh, I did play uh, flute and clarinet and piccolo in like uh, in high school for band, but I'm, I'm, I was never good at playing instruments. I could never sight read. <laughs> 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 Just kind of hanging on for dear life. Um, and then once it was like, you know, I don't have to do this anymore. It's like, oh yeah, I don't have to practice music anymore. Great. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was never good at it. <laughs> what is your go-to karaoke song? Ooh, that's hard. Um, I haven't done karaoke in so long that I don't think I have a go-to anymore. Um, and I'd love to say something by Journey, but those notes are really hard mm -hmm. to get sometimes, you know? <laughs> You're always going to leave with like a gravelly throat. Uh, Uriah Heep's Easy Living is great because, because there's no like crazy guitar solo. There's no like lead-in intro. It just starts off. It's like a two and a half minute song. So you're in, you're out. It's like a great easy range. There's no like crazy high notes. Um, yeah, so you're right, easy living. That's the best karaoke okay. song you could ever do. Either that or withstand the fall of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your favorite movie? I hate this question. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, maybe maybe we can make it uh, a little it broader does. for this it time of year. Does. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, are Are there any movies, shows you would suggest people watch right now for the spooky season? Just doesn't have to be favorites. Just things people should watch. Um, I, ooh, I'm probably gonna go back and watch the Orphanage, a uh, death horror film. Um, great movie. I haven't seen it in years, and I love rewatching movies because I feel like you get, um a sense of why you like it so much you know like when you've seen it and you're like oh i love this and then you can go back and rewatch it and think about like why do i love this like what are the things that are working for me in this is it like a shot is it a move a mood like uh, like how did how was that captured and and how can i do something like that with my art like how can i evoke some a feeling like that um so I, and i and i like the comfort of knowing what's going to happen so <laughs> i hate not knowing what's yeah, going to happen 
I, I'm a huge fan of watching things over and over again. I'm in the middle of just repeated viewings of uh, Last Man on Earth. Ooh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think um, another film I watched recently and I quite enjoyed uh, was called The Watcher. It was not the TV show The oh. Watcher. It was a film called The Watcher. Oh, okay. It's not really a horror film. It's more of a thriller, I guess. But I love the atmosphere in that movie. Um, and it was just like very tense you know one of those movies that like amps the tension up and just kind of keeps it at a certain level through the whole film uh and i quite enjoyed that well, because we're I'm best ask friends specific. now i've got a you know we can talk about anything we're best friends now <laughs> what is your most embarrassing moment uh, i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i have so many <laughs> it's so hard to choose um geez now I have to think about it. Um, I don't know. I can't, you know, there's so many moments that I'll wake up in the middle of the night and like wish I could do over <laughs> and I can't <laughs> admit to any of them right now. Oh, it's, okay. just awful. it's just too awful. I mean, it's probably just, and it, they're probably bad ones too. It's like, oh, I said this stupid thing, like blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Yeah, that's oh, always no. the time that it catches you the worst. You'll wake up and you're sweating something that you did a long time ago that yeah in that half asleep <laughs> state your mind thinks it's a big problem right now and you have to rectify it <laughs> yeah yeah it's like something you know i don't know that i did or something that i said it's gonna be this moment i'm gonna wake up tonight and be like oh i know what i should have said it would have been so witty and so funny and so charming but <laughs> no it's just um i don't but <laughs> <laughs> all the time <laughs> Okay, and here's one that I like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can cut all that out. Okay. Uh, I like to ask this one. What is the best piece of advice you were ever given and who gave it to you? Could be professional, personal, anything. Um, I, You know, the best piece of advice, it was probably rough actually to me to just drop out of school. That was really I, good Somehow advice. I was expecting that. Like, how would um, it not be? But I'm trying to think about, like, other good advice. Um I think, you know, just life advice, life advice in general. And, you know, my dad, who maybe didn't always give the best advice, but he always told me, like, stick to your guns. Uh, and I would always imagine, like, just like your hands are covered in glue and they're like stuck to these guns. You're like, I don't know what to do. Um, but it actually is something that I think about quite often because, um, going back to like you know it's one of those things if you have an idea to do something you should just do it no matter what uh, i mean of course unless it's bad don't do that <laughs> <laughs> but um you know when i first wanted to go to school for art uh, you know everyone tells you no you know teachers and parents and no one wants you to do this but you do it anyway um and then when i went to drop out no one wanted me to drop out it was like <laughs> it's a kind of argued to, to drop out of school again and I did it anyway. Um, making comics, it's like this whole industry sometimes feel like it can like bear down on you uh, from any standpoint, I think no matter what part of the industry you're in. Um, as a creator, even as like, even as a fan, sometimes it can feel like what the hell is going on? Just stick with it, you know? <laughs> you, I believe in it, I believe in comics, I love making them um, and I'm just gonna keep doing them. So that's my advice. We hope you do. Find the thing that you love and, and do it. Definitely. Yeah. And that's it. That's all I got. Mm. That's plenty. What's your favorite vacation spot? Oh, I like a good staycation, you know? <laughs> <laughs> if I don't have to put any effort into it. Um, but I, I love uh, actually Thought Bubbles coming up uh, in the UK. Oh, yeah. um, that's a show that Tula used to run. And that might have been how we met, actually, was she was like running that show. I didn't even realize she was an artist until later. And, um, you know, we became friends. And so that show kind of means a lot to me. And every time I get to go out there, uh, it's like quite a treat. Um, yeah, I get to see Lisa again in a few weeks. Very nice. Cons are kind of like the vacation. So it's like. <laughs> if you could have dinner with three people from past or present who would it be oh my god i don't know 
Um, that's a that's a hard question. I'm so bad at these like right off the top of your head questions. <laughs> I'm like I, I don't I, I can't think quickly. Um, geez, I don't know. Um, and they're not going to be good answers. I think if I was going to, I mean, it would probably be friends first of all. But if I had to pick people, I didn't know if I'd be like total strangers to me. I feel like I would. There's a manga artist named Kaoru Mori who does a book called Emma, and she does a book called like The Bride's Tale or Bride Story. Um, and she does these afterwards in her comics that I think are so cute. And I read them and I'm like, we would totally go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I would invite her for sure. And maybe it would just be like a date. It would be the two of us. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. It's not a good, that's not a good answer, but no, that's, that's a great I'm, answer. That's, that's a great answer because it's the truth. <laughs> it is the truth. That's where I'm at right now. You know? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's also, I was, I feel like anyone else, I'd just be disappointed. You don't really know, you know. Like, what if you meet them and they're a jerk? It's like, yeah, oh, yeah, and they suck. Why? They, you know, yeah. they they say don't they say don't meet your heroes. Yeah, don't meet. <laughs> your That's heroes. not always true. It's no. not always true. You're right. Uh, so I was <laughs> texting with uh with Tom after he got off here. He had a uh, a minor emergency with his dog. That was why he dropped <laughs> off. But uh, I saw oh. a picture that he had added in here, and I did because he had added it in, I asked him what the story was with it. So this is one of Tom's uh, action figure photography photos that uh, he was going to uh, bring up just because. Oh, look at that. If, if you look in the background there, there's uh, the Abath poster back there. Oh, yeah. So this is a Dick show, oh, he's got uh, the, showing uh, the Damien his area. metal collection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, he, he wanted to bring that up uh, <laughs> as well. But... That's funny. Not quite like that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we could bring that all together, you know? There Absolutely. you go. That, that's a nice bow. Tie but uh, before we get out of here, uh, I want to touch back to Somna real quick. So uh, the solicitation for Somna describes, uh, you know, as erotic folk horror. If someone reads that and says, WTF, does that mean? <laughs> How would you uh, tell people what to expect from the story and why they don't want to miss it? Yeah, Somna is uh, a spooky, sexy story. It's perfect for Halloween. Um, and even though it comes out in November, that's still Halloween, really. Yeah. Um, the spooky season just kind of goes on uh, indefinitely. So, um, you know, it's this is a book that I have never really done anything like it because I've never worked with another writer and artist at the same time. You know, this collaboration that we're doing is something that's like, it feels, it feels exciting. Um, and so hopefully that feeling is kind of conveyed in the book. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Well, I well, would say it's the scarlet letter with a cult twist. Oh, oh, like a this with a that. Yeah, with yeah. Uh, some uh, some supernatural kind of stuff going yeah. on. Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah, um, and that that's that's a good thing though that it is not easily defined. Yeah, you know, you yeah, you, don't, you don't want every book you read to just be something that you can wrap it up uh, with a neat little bow. Yeah. Yeah, this is um, Somna is um, it's like a very sexy Hammer horror film. So. there you go and and, <laughs> yeah. and it's got uh it's got witch hunting trials and witch burning and all that uh horrid stuff and uh dream world stuff going on and yeah, yeah. we're uh yeah. obviously we're we're both on board from issue one. Oh yeah yeah so it's you guys a, have knocked it out of the park it's a romp <laughs> yes <laughs> so somna Three issues beginning November 22nd. If you haven't already done so, let your comic shops know that you want a copy of it. Don't miss out on it. And yeah, uh, please, please don't miss out on it. I would, I would hate for that. Absolutely. And uh, we will talk to you guys again about Somna once it's in stores. Uh, we'll, we'll have to chat about this a little bit more once people can read it. But yeah. uh, this was Becky Cloonan. That was Bat Forest Radio. Somna, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank Hashtag sleepwanking and have a good night. <laughs> <laughs>